On this episode of Skeptico, here goes. Here's the book. Every book needs a title. Here's mine. Why Skeptics Are Wrong About Almost Everything. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode, we're going to start a new project. You know, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, am I going to write a book based on my experience on Skeptic, what I've learned, some of the crazy stories that have come up over the years? And I've always said no, but recently, I've started to change my mind. You know, maybe a book that chronicles my journey, all the craziness that I've encountered with skeptics, atheists, wacky scientism believers, and all the fundamentalist religious types I've talked to, maybe that'd be a good idea. You know, I've always approached Skeptico as my personal journey shared with others. But as you know, and I've said this so many times, in this process, I've realized that really sharing these interviews with you, the listener, has been an important part of the whole thing because it's created this feedback loop that has really propelled me forward. You've suggested so many ideas for shows. You've also changed my thinking about shows and the way that I approach things. And that interaction has been an important part of this process for me. So when I started thinking about this book, I started thinking about two things along those lines. One, I started thinking, It might be good to write a book because I might get that kind of interaction and feedback and have an opportunity to reformulate what I really think about these topics. And number two, I thought, why don't I write the book in a way that promotes that feedback, promotes that interaction with you, the Skeptico audience? And I think I came up with a pretty cool, interesting new way of doing this. At least I've never heard anyone do it this way before. So let me tell you a little bit about that and then also tell you about the topic that we're going to start with today, skeptics and mediums. So here goes. Here's the book. Every book needs a title. Here's mine. Why Skeptics Are Wrong About Almost Everything. Here then is how I'm going to write it, and I just alluded to this, but I'm going to go through the topics that we've covered on Skeptico. These big question topics that science and no one else ever seems to tackle completely. And I'm going to re-examine them primarily focused on this idea of how skeptics look at it. And from what I've experienced, and you know this if you listen to the show, how hopelessly flawed the skeptical take on these things invariably turns out to be. Of course, I'm not saying that the skeptics are always wrong by definition, I'm just saying they have a really, really bad batting average, at least from my experience. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason why this skeptical nonsense is engineered to fail. And that's something I'd like to talk about as well. Spoiler alert, it's because they got the consciousness science thing all wrong, but we'll get to that in a minute. One thing I'd like to emphasize from the beginning is... I don't have a lot of answers, at least not anything that's firmed up. But I think, as you'll appreciate, on a lot of these big question areas, just being able to say, that's probably not the answer, is a huge paradigm-shifting step forward. So that's what this book is going to try to do. It's a book that's going to look at the best evidence that I've discovered on topics like consciousness, near-death experience, telepathy, psychics, UFOs, and a lot of other stuff. And then in particular, I'm going to focus on whether the skeptical party line, and there's always a skeptical party line, will look at how that stacks up against the evidence that I've discovered on Skeptico. So I plan to tackle one topic in each chapter of the book. For example, in this show and in this chapter, I'm going to talk about why skeptics are wrong about psychics and mediums. So I'm going to go over some of the basics And then I'm going to explain why we might want to look past some of the debunking shenanigans and wholesale dismissal of this phenomena that we hear constantly from skeptics. The chapter of this episode, what you're going to hear, is going to draw from the shows and the many interviews I've done with psychics and mediums and, of course, researchers in the field. 
Now, as you know, because you're listening to this right now, I'm going to publish an audio version of each chapter on The Skeptico Show, and after I publish it, I'm going to ask for your help in suggesting any additions, deletions, or or other edits that I might want to make to this chapter. I then plan on rolling those changes into the transcript, handing it off to my writer, editor, slash co-author to whip into shape, and voila, hopefully I'll have a book out of this. And oh yeah, speaking of writer, editor, co-author, I'm looking for someone. So if you're out there and you're a good fit for this gig and can live with the very modest advance that I'm offering, then drop me an email and uh, let's chat about that. Finally, just to mention as an aside, as with all the quote-unquote products on Skeptico, the book will be free or as close to free as is practical given the realities of Amazon book publishing and the need to kind of get this thing out there. At any rate, it's not a money-making proposition. It's just a way to further explore these very underexplored areas of skepticism and science. So let's get going with the chapter on why skeptics are wrong about psychics and mediums. By the way, this isn't necessarily going to be the first chapter in the book. It's just the first episode I'm publishing, and I picked it because I realized I haven't touched on this topic in quite a while, and I thought it'd be good to dive back in. And as a matter of fact, as I got into it, I'm really glad that I did, because what I realized is how many interviews and how much work I did on this topic. I, I counted them up, and I found at least 25 interviews. And that doesn't include all the private interviews I did with mediums as part of this research demonstration project that you'll hear about. So before I get into all that, let me start with the big picture. I want to answer that question that I asked right off the bat. So why are skeptics wrong about psychics and mediums? That is, and this is an important reframing, why do skeptics believe that no one in recorded history has ever had some form of strange, unexplainable communication with a deceased loved one? Three reasons. Number one, they're willfully ignorant of the research. Number two, they've never properly investigated the topic themselves. And number three, they live in a constructed worldview that doesn't allow this stuff to happen. So first off, let me go back and talk a little bit about my framing of the skeptical assertion. No one ever has had any form of anomalous communication in any form auditory or a smell that came up that couldn't be explained, any of the things that you hear about in all these things. That has never happened ever in history in any form with any deceased loved one. That's the skeptical claim. Now, as we'll see in a minute, skeptics like to focus on psychic scams, overblown claims of mediums, and all this other stuff in order to ridicule anyone associated with the topic. So they want to focus on some of the fraud and deception that we know happen because that's a pretty effective technique to get people distracted. If someone focuses on a grieving parent who got ripped off by some psychic scam artist, well, then you're well on the way to derailing any serious consideration of this topic. But that's not what I wanted to do when I investigated it, and that's not what I want to do here in this episode. If we can manage to sidestep that bit of skeptical sleight of hand that wants you to focus on the, on the psychic scams, we can take a step back and really look at the scientific claim they're making. No one ever in any way, right? That's the claim. Because if anyone ever got a single bit of information from some non-physical, spiritual, whatever that means kind of being, then the skeptics are wrong. And more importantly, the scientific paradigm that we've built upon that idea that that can never happen, well, then that falls too. So let me take you back then to the beginning of my exploration of this topic on Skeptico. It began when I contacted Dr. Gary Schwartz in 2006. Now, as some of you know, Dr. Gary Schwartz is a professor of psychology and medicine at the University of Arizona, and he really became associated with this topic and caused quite a stir back in the early 2000s, at least for a little bit he did. Now, I say a little bit because as you're going to see or hear, 
the story of Dr. Schwartz, in addition to offering some fascinating research on psychics and mediums, also provides some interesting insights into how the whole skeptical academia status quo power structure really operates. But more on that in a minute. First, a little bit about Gary, who, as it turns out, is an incredibly smart guy, PhD, psychology, Harvard University, then became an assistant professor at Harvard for five years, which, if you know anything about academia, is unheard of, that you get a PhD and they respect you so much that they immediately put you on the faculty. Later, he was the chair of the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry at Yale University. I mean, this is a stellar academic background. And then, believe it or not, because he has the cred, he received a $2 million grant on NIH to study this kind of fringy, medium, frontier of science consciousness stuff. Unheard of that he could get money for this. So anyways, he has all this academic credibility, and he becomes really interested in psychics and mediums, and he starts investigating them as these amazing findings, starts publishing these books, so then he becomes the whack-a-mole that sticks his head up, and he becomes a huge target. So the first attack on Gary Schwartz is that his research is crap. And one of the reasons I want to go over his academic credentials, and one of the reasons they're so interesting in this case, is because the claim made against Dr. Schwartz and his research into mediumistic communication, and it's the same claim that's repeated with mantra-like repetitiveness against all researchers in this area, was that he hadn't implemented proper controls in his experiments. Now, mind you, we're not talking about sophisticated controls here. I mean, they're somewhat sophisticated, but not really. And you'll hear much more about this later in the show. But, I mean, the basic proposition here is that the medium needs to be blinded from outside information. Very basic, common stuff. The whole, so look, the whole idea that a guy like Gary Schwartz with this stellar academic background, a guy who's, who's published over 400 scientific papers, including six in the journal Science, the idea that he's stumbling over basic common sense blinding problems, the kind of mistakes that a freshman psychology student would make, it's just a silly claim. It's an outrageous claim, but it still gets a lot of traction especially for folks who are looking to take down Gary Schwartz in this research, because these are debunkers and they're just looking for anything to attack. So they attacked his research and then they circled the wagons and then they really got him. In 2007, they got a sensationalized Geraldo Rivera story, literally Geraldo Rivera on TV, about Dr. Schwartz's fundraising and they called that into question and they had the grieving parent on there, the whole thing. You can go read about all that. I'm not going to go into the whole story here. But Dr. Schwartz, being a sharp guy and a smart guy, realized it was time to pull the plug on the medium research, at least at the University of Arizona, back off of all of that. He has a lot of other research that he's continued to do. He didn't lose his job or anything like that. But I'm sure the powers that be at Arizona said, hey, we don't need that kind of attention. And Dr. Schwartz moved on. But fortunately for me, that's where the story really begins. Because while I had talked to Gary a couple times, I never managed to get a full interview out of him. But what I did manage to get was an introduction to his research associate, who, as it turns out, is really the person who is doing the heavy lifting when it came to medium research setting up protocols, doing analysis, all of that stuff. And her name is Dr. Julie Beischel, who is quite a delightful person, really smart, PhD in pharmacology, expert on really setting up protocols to test medicine, pharmacology, you know, getting stuff past the FDA. So really smart about research and testing protocols. So I met Julie several times in person. If you've listened to the show, you know I've had her on the show several times as well. And what I wanted to do for this chapter is share with you an interview I did with Julie back in August of 2008. This is when I had just started my own research into psychics and mediums. And it's back when I naively thought that all it took to convince skeptics was some good, solid research. 
So in this interview, you'll hear me reference Ben Radford, who is a science writer and a skeptic who came on Skeptico with all these reasons why this research should be ignored, all these criticisms of Gary Schwartz's research and the research in general. Turns out, of course, he didn't have a clue of what he was talking about, but that doesn't matter. You'll hear all that. You'll also hear reference to my old frenemy, Dr. Stephen Novella, who is a neurologist at Yale, professor, and the skeptic who hosts a popular weekly skeptical podcast. Now, one of the things that I did way back in this research was to challenge Steve to take part in a research demonstration project with psychics and mediums. So I was on his show and I said, look, you guys don't believe psychics and mediums are real. Let's do a demonstration. We'll do a medium reading for you on the air and then we'll rate it and we'll see if anything comes out of that. Well, he initially agreed to this, but he never really followed through. He didn't respond to emails. The whole thing dragged on and fizzled out. But since he initially agreed to this, he sent me down this path of doing this project. I did the project. I did the medium research demonstration project. And that's why I have so many shows on psychics and mediums. I interviewed all these interesting people, all sorts of folks, including like hardcore skeptic Lynn Kelly. I did a show with her. She came on, claimed uh, that she could demonstrate how cold reading techniques could explain everything you'd ever want to know about psychic medium readings which is a totally silly idea that you can dismiss after hearing about five minutes of what Julie has to say. But it's just to give you an idea of the skeptical nonsense that I had to wade through to really cover this topic the way that I wanted to. I also had some interesting interviews with Stephen Novella, which you can go back and listen to. I'm not going to include them in this chapter, but if you want that kind of background, it's kind of interesting to see how, that whole, how the whole project evolved in that way. But right now, what I want to get to is this long clip. It's actually most of the whole episode from this interview that I had with Dr. Julie Baischel back in 2008. And on this episode, we're going to look at the psychic medium experiment that we've been doing. Now, I haven't spoken much about it in the last few episodes, but there's been a lot going on really for the last few months. So let me take everyone back to the beginning, at least the skeptico beginning. And let's start by maybe defining terms a little bit. I think everyone who's listening to this show is probably familiar with psychic medium communication. Someone's lost a loved one, they go and talk to a psychic or a medium, and they try and connect with that loved one through some anomalous means that we don't fully understand. Now, keep in mind that the skeptical take on psychic medium communication, and this is certainly the position of mainstream science as well, is no way, no how. Never been proven, and you get a lot of this hundred years of nothing stuff. So once again, and I really feel a need to point this out, we are faced with this absolutely insane disconnect between what science is investigating and what people care most deeply about. I mean, let's face it, what happens to us after we die is something we all think about and we all care deeply about. So in terms of this experiment, it really started about 18 months ago when I appeared on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe show with Dr. Steve Novella. And I challenged those folks to do a public demonstration of psychic medium work to show that it really does happen. And you may recall that we had a lot of communication about that, but it never really came to pass, at least for a year it didn't. And then near the end of last year in 2008, I decided to tackle this project on my own, or at least to dig into it, and that's what I've been doing. I've updated you several times on the progress that we've made, but this is going to be a little bit of a different update, because the project has personally taken a couple turns for me that I couldn't have expected, but have been wonderfully enlightening, and I want to share a little bit of that with you. You know, first, this whole thing has been terrific. I mean, it's been fascinating to speak with so many psychics mediums, out-of-body travelers. I mean, one thing you run into right away when you get into this is that you find that the labels that we sometimes throw around don't sit well with the folks doing the work, and I want to respect that. So that's been amazing. It's also been amazing to connect with so many folks who are dealing with the death of someone close to them. It hasn't always been pleasant and fun, but it's been rewarding on a different level. 
So in the last few months as I've been running these trials, I've learned a lot. I've certainly made a lot of mistakes and then I've kind of come back and learned some more. And then a couple of months ago, I reached a little bit of a turning point. I had run about three trials on the medium experiment and the way that I was doing it. I had achieved some mixed results. Some of the experiments were showing extraordinary results, a million to one above chance levels. Others were not. Some of the readings were personally transformative for the people who were grieving. Others were not. Now, along the way, all along the way, I kept asking our mediums how we could improve the experiment, how we could make it better. And the answer I got, and I got this a number of different ways, but ultimately the way I came to understand it is that I have to slow down and do these experiments, these trials, one at a time. And it's funny because I came to appreciate at a deeper level something that Julie Beischel said a while back. And it's something that I initially kind of bristled against. And that's that you have to serve everyone involved, the living and the dead. Now, I know that sounds a little bit strange, but hang in there with me because that's what this show is all about. It's about one reading. One gifted person who's somehow able to connect with people who've died. It's also about one grieving mother. And it's about one young adult who tragically decided to take her own life. The story starts back in January of this year, 09, when I was in the process of recruiting mediums for this experiment. And I ran into Marilyn Hughes of the Get This Skeptics. You're going to love this. The Out of Body Travel Foundation at outofbodytravel.org. Now, if you're one to snicker at the name, just wait until you dig into what Marilyn has to say. For many of us, even believers, the idea of God sending people on a journey through countless levels of spiritual realms in order to aid lost souls, all a little hard to take. But two things that drove me forward with Marilyn were, one, I'm no longer put off by folks who believe in strange things that I don't have any experience with. Heck, if Skeptico has taught me anything, it's that a lot of very down-to-earth people, like skeptics, believe in all sorts of things that they don't have any experience with. And the second thing that drove me forward is that there was just something very engaging about Marilyn. I don't know, I just really liked her almost immediately. So I was really thrilled when Marilyn agreed to an interview. But when we first started talking about the experiment and what we might be able to do together scientifically, I had some real doubts it was going to work out. I think you'll see what I mean from this first clip. Well, it's an interesting question. And um, I've been thinking about what I would what I'd say to you in terms of like how I think it could be done. And I think the thing that I would share is that from what I've experienced, this is where the challenge lies for science is that when we leave our bodies and we go into different spiritual states, we enter worlds that have different laws than third dimensional reality. And so in order to take science into that study, somehow we have to integrate and include those different laws of existence Different laws of existence? Isn't this the kind of woo-woo stuff that just drives skeptics crazy? But you have to ask yourself one question. What if it's real? And that's the question I asked. So I pushed forward with Marilyn. I told her about the trials we'd already done. I told her about some of the other out-of-body experience research that had been published. So my dialogue with Marilyn continued, and we started to kind of hone in on something that we might be able to do. Here's Marilyn again. You know, the one thing that I think is more likely to be workable in terms of what my situation is, is uh, utilizing out-of-body experiences for uh, messages for people. And I don't know how far we can take it. Um, I do receive you know, in out of body travel. I don't I don't have the mediumship thing like a John Edward or someone like that. Right. I receive messages and people come visit me in out of body experiences. That sort of thing is actually fairly common and I don't it's so common that I don't even really document it. Um there are a few people that I could bring forward that could share some of the things I've told them. Um 
that I can remember or that I still have contact with because a lot of times it's someone who randomly comes across my site and asks for help and I just tell them I'll pray and if I get permission I'll let them know what I hear and then you know that's the last I'll tell them what what happened and they're happy and they move on and I don't you know I don't, I don't keep track of them but I could start keeping track of them and and then you're talking about probably doing it in a controlled environment and I think ironically uh, one of the things that is much more powerful with these experiences is that personal contact. So if you're doing it in a university setting or something and you have a pool of people who have some kind of needs or whatever that I can actually face, talk to, touch, and um, I just see them, it's much more likely to uh, happen that way. Does that make sense? That's awesome. So it, it, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. Is that you re- generally, because you attract so many people with your message and through other ways, people come to you and say, Marilyn, can you please help me with connecting with so-and-so? Right. And, and then in your in your experience, a lot of times those messages are answered and then you pass those along to the to the folks. Right. And see, what happens is it's not just that, though, and that's why I'm saying I'm not sure how far we can go with it. Um, in a situation like that, because because it is God-directed rather than me-directed, um, it can happen in a number of ways. You know, somebody might want to have contact with a relative who's passed on, but yet it might be one of their guardian angels who comes to me and says, well, this right. is what they actually need to know. So we're not sending um, Dad to see them today. I'm coming to tell you this. Then there are other times, too, when they have problems or issues that are going on in their life that will be shown to me in some way, shape, or form and how they uh, might best handle it. And so it can be in a variety of ways that it would sh- that it would happen. So at this point, I was starting to get a pretty clear idea about how we might run an experiment with Marilyn. And I was really impressed with her openness and her willing to do this. I've spoken with a number of mediums, and when you really get down to brass tacks about doing a public experiment, really putting them on the spot they sometimes get reluctant. And I understand that. It can be a real setup to take something that is this extraordinary and try and put it under a spotlight and say, do it now. It just doesn't happen that way. But that wasn't where Marilyn was coming from. She just wanted to push forward and find the best way to do it. So I started asking her how we might refine it, how we might find the best possible candidates. I don't know why I didn't think of mentioning this before, but you know, I work at the Catholic Church, and so, of course, we do... Um, two or three funerals a week on average. And um, one of the things that seems to happen, and, and this can sometimes even happen while I'm awake, where the person will just all of a sudden be with me and all of a sudden they're just talking, talking, talking. And I'll just be, sometimes, you know, I'll do this without even letting the people know that I feel their presence because not everyone's open to this. But it still helps them when you tell them these things because, uh, the deceased person knows what those family members believed beforehand, and they present it to me in a way that they know the family can hear and listen to. And so what I have found is that it's the unresolved ones that are more likely to come through. That's part of the reason, you know, I'll pick these people up, you know, just driving down the street. Uh, if you drive by a car accident and there's some souls that are still there and they have this unresolved stuff. So it, there can be a lot of things, murder, suicide, accidental overdoses. Okay, this was a good little twist, a good little insight into Marilyn's process. And I want to follow through with that. So I took some of the other points that Marilyn had mentioned and we talked a little bit further. We nailed down the particulars and how we we're going to run this trial. And I set off on finding us a participant. Now, I've been running an ad in Craigslist looking for participants for the last several months, so I have a pretty good database of potential sitters to choose from. And when I sorted these people by the criteria that Meryl and I had talked about, I had four or five people that I thought would be pretty good. But I wound up picking Michelle, and I'm not going to reveal her last name because it's really not necessary. Michelle had lost a daughter to suicide at age 20, and she was looking to connect and had volunteered for the experiment. So I emailed Michelle and then eventually wound up talking to her on the phone and asked her if she wanted to not only participate in the medium experiment, but participate in this more in-depth public trial 
and she agreed. So here's the protocol we set up. I asked Michelle to send me an article of clothing that her daughter had worn. And she did. She sent me a hat that was very special to her. I also asked her to send me some photographs. She did that as well. And I collected some general information about her daughter. First name, date of birth, date of passing. This is all information that Marilyn had said she would like to have during the reading. Now, I was acting as the proxy. All information would be sent to me, and then I would send all that information along to Marilyn. Then I would receive the reading from Marilyn, and I'd pass it along to Michelle. Now, since all the readings came through in email, this was an easy thing to do in terms of controlling exactly the amount of information that went through to Marilyn. So here's what happened, and this is amazing part of the story number one. While Michelle was in the process of sending me the hat and the photos, I passed along a little bit of information to Marilyn. Now, I want you to put yourself in Marilyn's position for a minute. Here's the information that you received. You don't know who I've selected. You have no idea. But here's the information you receive. First name, Megan. And then I'm going to give you the month and day, but not the year that she was born. And I'm going to give you the date that she passed. Okay, so that's all you have. You have that information. Now, I was going to send her the rest. I was going to send her the hat, and I was going to send her the photo, but I hadn't done that yet. I had just passed along that information that I gave you. So next, I want to share with you the first email reading I received from Marilyn based on that limited amount of information. Marilyn starts out, Megan is a soul who definitely wishes to make contact with her family and apparently has some level of permission from God to do so. I have some random things to share that she showed me. I don't know what they mean. We'll let the family see if they mean anything. Let me interject that even though she gives me this information and I pass it along to the family, I never give Marilyn any feedback on any of that information. I never tell her what's a hit, what isn't. So here are some of the things that she has to say. First, she showed me what appeared to be a college environment. This is in fact correct. Megan was in college right before she committed suicide. She was about 20 years old when she died. Again, she had no way of knowing that. Back to her reading. The next part was definitely not what I was expecting. I don't know what this means, but I watched her begin on campus and then somehow get lost. She ended up not being on campus, but I didn't feel like she was that far away. She wandered off with a woman who is definitely very clearly lesbian. It seems that Megan wasn't sure for a very, very short time of her identity, but she soon realized that she was not a lesbian and she refused to participate. My sense was that she was definitely showing me a time in the late teens, early 20s. I'll find out when the pictures arrive, if this is an appropriate age at which she died or not. Well, it did turn out to be an appropriate age. It was the exact time when she died. And the university angle does play into this as well because Megan was raised in a major university town and this kind of interplay comes back and forth in the reading over and over again. So these couple of facts were really, really important and they became even more important after Marilyn received the photos and Megan's hat and then continued with her second reading. Here, I'll share with you some of that. Megan told me that her death was very, very hard on her mom and that she really loved her mom and had a very close relationship with her. Now, before you scoff at this, I have to tell you, I've done a bunch of readings at this point, and it's certainly not a given that there's a strong bond between a daughter and a mother. Sometimes there's a lot of animosity there. So this is also a, a hit, a minor hit, but it's a hit. And also, uh, you know, since I hadn't revealed to Michelle that it was Megan's mother who was trying to connect, or even the name of the person who was trying to connect, whether it was a male or a female, uh, it makes it even more interesting. So before you kind of dismiss some of these things, go, of course, of course, because you already know the end story, think back and remember the information that you had. You didn't have any of that information. Okay, next we have a couple of points that turn out to be very, very significant to the family in terms of understanding Megan's death. The first is Marilyn reports that Megan experienced a returning home to her faith, like she had been somewhere else for a while. Marilyn's reading says it was like she had been somewhere else for a while, maybe off to college or a different location. Maybe she just went away from the church and she came back and she was very happy to be back. But she goes on to say it was kind of a calm before the storm. This is Marilyn again. Yes, I'm hearing from her underlined a calm before the storm. She thought she had found her way back home, but something else was going to happen. Then she said, the woman told me a different story. Something she told me wasn't true. 
she emphasized this again and now writes this. Now, I know all that might sound a little bit cryptic, but it's very important, very relevant to the story, because as it turns out, this is exactly the kind of spiritual crisis, if you will, that Megan was going through. And it doesn't matter what you think about a spiritual crisis. It's her experience, and it's what her mother recalls her going through. So so she had somehow drifted away from her spiritual tradition. Then she had found her way back. She was back reading the Bible and in a Christian group, because that's what was important to her. But then that was the calm before the storm, and then the storm, of course, is her eventual suicide. I don't think that's really reading too much into it. That's pretty much what the reading says. And as you'll soon hear, Megan's mom confirms this is actually what happens. So back to Marilyn's reading. Marilyn writes that this case reminds her of another case she worked on where a family member came and said that, where a family had come to her and said that they'd lost someone through an accident, but the police had never figured out this had been an accident or a suicide or a murder, and it caused a lot of pain in the family. She goes on to say that Megan's case sounds something like this to me. There's something about Megan that the family does not fully know. But based on the way she's presented this to me, I'm not sure that the family knows that there is something they don't know yet. Now, this part of the reading turns out to be very significant to Megan's mom. In fact, it was the primary reason she contacted me, although I didn't know it at the time. I only knew it after I revealed this reading to her, and she came back and said, I have to tell you, Megan's death has caused a major divide in our family. Her death was clearly a suicide, but there's a part of my family who isn't willing to accept that she really killed herself, and they think that there's other reasons behind it. She was on medication, antidepressant medication. She had gone through some uh, car accident, was on pain medication, and they want to believe that there were other reasons behind it, and it's caused a real divide in our family. So that is certainly a very, very unusual set of circumstances, and I have no way of explaining how Marilyn could possibly tune into that. Now, Marilyn provided three more email readings for the family. Two of them were very brief, and one of them was pretty long. The amount of factual, verifiable data in them is relatively small, but they altogether had a very, very profound effect on the family. But there is one other little verifiable fact that came through that I think is amazing in the way that so many of these readings are amazing, in that it's a very, very small point, but it had great significance to the family. It's in the last reading that Marilyn provides, and she says, I see Megan, and she's smiling, and there are these flowers all around her face. It's a strange symbol. And then she goes on to say, I think these flowers are peonies. Now, the only reason this point's important, and the only person this point is important to, is Megan's mom. Because right around the time that she received this message, she had been talking to her husband about planting a garden specifically for Megan, to honor Megan. And she was asking her husband what kind of flowers she thinks that she should plant in there. And just about this time, she gets this message. Coincidence? Synchronicity? Who knows? Just another point to add to the whole story. And you'll hear more about that a little later when we talk to Megan's mom. But first, I want to go back to my second interview with Marilyn. This is a follow-up. The trial's basically over. I'm ready to share the results with Marilyn. And I also want to talk about the process that she went through in arriving at this rather remarkable data. So what was your process in terms of connecting with Megan? Well, you know, with Megan, it was almost instantaneous. Um you had given me, I think it was via email, or was it, I don't know if we spoke on the phone or if you'd given it, I think you gave it to me via email, and then I just asked for the date of death, because sometimes it's very important and helpful when you know how long someone has been crossed over, because there are different stages in death, and so um, different types of timing, you're going to be more likely to reach them in different locations, but with Megan... As soon as I got her name and you gave me those dates, I could feel her. She was just all over me. And it was like, wow, this this girl wants to talk to her family. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then it was that very night. The process is really not something that I control. But what I, uh, it's a process where um, when I go to bed at night, I have these out-of-body experiences, and then the person who is deceased will show me things. And a lot of times they show you, and I believe I experienced, based on what you just shared with me, her moment of death um, in the last reading, 
I think that's when, when she probably died because I had woken up uh, bone cold. Uh, it was in, I don't know if you recall this. She was in a room and she, I woke up bone cold and that's what felt like, oh, she must have died then. So the process is going, you know, you go out of body. The person takes you on a, on a visual where you like re- almost experience it with them. It's almost like you become them in the experience where you're experiencing part of their life as them. So you can feel their emotions, their feelings, everything that's going through their mind. And that's part of the process that is very important for the, usually for the remaining family members, because um, a lot of times in a situation like this, um, the difference is uh, exactly what was it that this person was confused about and because uh, the families always blame themselves, and it's always helpful for them to know, if it's possible, what was it that led to the the, the moment uh, of their death, mm-hmm. that, and what were they thinking, and how did that come about? What who were the people that led them there? What was the actual, you know? Um, and a lot of times too, it's about taking that personal responsibility, which they always do after death we all do we all have to take the personal responsibility for our own decisions and stuff but then it's um there's there's so many things involved in it but it's primarily something that is led by i i I believe that it's led by god and he allows people to do this when it's helpful for their spirit and for someone who might be left behind um, if you'll recall in our first conversation, I said the one the one factor that I have no control over is whether or not it's allowed. And a lot of times in a situation, because I don't control it, I don't just you know conjure it up and and stuff. It it comes to me or it doesn't. And um, generally in a situation where someone has some unfinished business after crossing over, there's more likely a chance that they will be allowed to do this. Um, and to share this kind of experience and come back through someone who has a gift like this than if um, if there's not any major unfinished business. You know, it's that's interesting, and it's also interesting that you're talking about God and the religious mysticism aspect of it. It's particularly interesting in this case, and this can be very controversial and very challenging for a lot of folks, but these are just the facts of this case. One of the things that you reported in your reading was this struggle that Megan was having and how she had uh, gone and drifted away from her spiritual path and had run into some pretty bad people along the way, and then she had found her way back uh, Mm -hmm. on her spiritual path and was, uh, I don't know if you said specifically that she was reading the Bible or not. She was back in a church. Back in a church. Back in a group, uh, a religious group of some kind. uh, The the way she presented to me, it was the faith of her youth. Well, this is exactly what happened in Megan's case. So again, this is after, yeah, she had, uh, while she was at university, she had befriended uh, this woman who was really kind of a bad news person. This woman was running, uh, was somewhat of a psychic, but was running a psychic scam and uh, they uh, had kind of a bank of phones. This woman also had a Wicca background. Uh, uh, you know whether that's good or bad. That explains can... a lot. Explains a lot. Yes. And this this relationship was you know quite troubling to Megan and to her family. But her mother reports that near the end she had come back to her Christian faith and was trying to get back into that and was reading the Bible regularly in that. So again, these are just the facts, and they match perfectly with the reading that you gave, and there really isn't an, a good or reasonable explanation for why you would connect any of that up or why you would provide any of that information. Now, Marilyn and I went over a number of other points about her reading, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in our conversation. I mean, you've given a lot of information here. It's not, it's not like talking on a phone, you know? right? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it isn't for you, but it certainly isn't in terms of the, you know, the information you're giving. Some of it is allegorical and has kind of other kinds of meaning that has to be 
kind of teased out of it, and some of it's very specific. So right, yeah, kind of giving a, a, a summation. I'll tell you one specific thing that you gave that had tr- tremendous meaning for okay. Megan's mom was the flowers. And, really? Uh, yes. She made a big deal about the flowers, and I almost, I was almost hesitant to even write it because I was like, how could this mean something? <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, okay, I'll just say it. <laughs> That's interesting. What meaning did that have? Megan's mom was in the process of building a flower bed specifically for M- Megan to kind of celebrate Megan and had been talking to her husband about, you know, I really want to start a little flower garden. In- wow, I'm getting slammed. <laughs> 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 now I understand because she had the flowers around her head and she, you know, it was just kind of like, a, it didn't quite make sense, you know, but now it makes perfect sense that yeah. uh, that the flowers would be surrounding her. <laughs> and those, wow. And those specific flowers that you, that you, you, you said, I, I can't say, I can't, I can't pronounce peonies? them. Peonies? Were they oh, peonies? peonies? Okay. I, I, I can't remember, but, you know, Megan's mom was so moved by this, that she went and researched these flowers and found that they were exactly the kind that you were looking for. They were indigenous to Texas. They met all the the criteria that she had, you know, laid out <laughs> in her mind in terms of how to construct this this flower bed to honor her daughter. So I think this Wow. Is- That's so exciting to hear that. You know, one of the interesting things about doing an experiment like this is that most of the time when I'm when it, this sort of thing is happening, I know a little bit about the family. Sometimes I don't know a whole lot like in that particular instance that I mentioned where it, where it reminded me of where they didn't know if it was an accident, suicide, or murder, but I didn't know that until the the person, the deceased person had come and told me, tell my brother it was an accident. And then he said, wow, that's really great, because we didn't know if it was an accident, a murder, or suicide. The police could never figure it out. And so, um, uh, but most of the time, I don't know, I know a little bit about the people or, um, They've written to me and they have information a little bit, you know, so I have a little bit to go on and then they give me feedback. And so this was actually very interesting for me to do as well because of the fact that there was the no feedback rule. And so it was, it was kind of running blind and just hoping that you're, uh, you're, you're catching what she's saying correctly and seeing things correctly and translating it correctly. You know what I mean? So oh, that's really exciting to hear, you know, of so many of the things that we had that 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 she had shared with me that I got it right and that it was helpful, you know what I mean? Well, and I think, and you can tell me if this is typical or not. And this is also going to be very very challenging for a lot of folks who aren't comfortable with this whole idea. Right. But beyond the the specific data that was evidential, and there was a lot of it. There were a lot of just uncanny coincidences that happened with Megan's mom during this process, during this week. Really? Yeah. In terms of emails that she got, in terms of lights going on and off uh, completely in a way that she had associated in the past with Megan's presence being close to her. Um, And in terms of her, her just knowing and feeling Megan's presence and feeling resolution to these things. So I don't know if that's typical, but it sounds like to me from talking to Megan's mom that this process that she went through in working with you without even knowing your name and knowing who you were, <laughs> but the, the process was very transformative for her. A lot of times it does it does happen like that. Not necessarily always like lights going on and off where there's physical phenomenon. But a lot of times people will actually have, um, uh, but of course this will happen more with people who like may have been to my website and they know what I look like, uh, where they'll see me in dreams and I'll tell them things or Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, There will be kind of a a mutual where there's information that's kind of moving uh, through both parties at the same time. And of course, I think in Megan's case, um, she obviously it was so strong, um, and it's interesting because just yesterday I was meeting with somebody who um, really wants to uh, make contact with a daughter who had died about 16 years ago, 
and I didn't feel a thing, you know, and it might be something where it comes up, uh, you know, in a week or two, because I, I mentioned to you in our first conversation, sometimes it happens immediately, sometimes it takes three months, sometimes it takes six months, and sometimes it never happens. It's it's all up to the will of God, not me. Mm-hmm. And um, it was very interesting with Megan, because she was just immediate. She really wanted to communicate with her mother, and um, and she made a lot of effort to do so. And it was almost it was almost difficult to keep up with her because there were so many interesting twists in her story, and knowing nothing about the story, you're like, okay, well, uh, I think I might have mentioned this in my first email. This is either really right on or just really crazy stuff. <laughs> 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 because I had no idea, you know, about whether or not you know all these interesting twists and turns. Um, where it was, but but that's what kind of uh, ironically makes doing an experiment like this very interesting too because she had a case where it would be highly difficult to guess that all the circumstances around it and when I actually she was showing them to me it was a little bit well this is kind of a little far out this is probably you know uh, you know it was kind of difficult uh, just receiving it and saying well um, and you know even with the um, the issue of questioning her sexuality and the woman who was a lesbian, I did, you know, you don't want to um, make things worse with the family if this is right. something they don't know about or if it's not correct. Right. <laughs> so you're, you're very, you know, so this was actually probably a very interesting case to utilize because it had so many interesting um, facets to it. I think we stayed very true to our original goal of keeping it you know, blinded and assigned. Totally blind, yes. yeah. And, and I think it's also, it's been a learning process for me, too, in terms of how to do these experiments. And I think so many things came out of this process for me. And, and one of the big things came out is just how important this work is for the people involved. And I want to make sure that going forward, I really honor that and I really respect that and do that work from that, you know, do this experiment, which is important. The scientific part of it is important, but I, going forward, I really want to make sure that we do this from that place, from that place of honor and respect, because, you know, there is a higher, there is some kind of higher meaning to all this. And that's the, we have to honor that while we discover it. Well, it's really important that people know that, well, there's, there's been a, a lot of people hear about the people who will just say they connect with the dead for random purposes, but it's real important for people to know that when, when this kind of contact is actually allowed, it's for it, what I would call an eternal purpose. And you're absolutely right. It has to be respected and honored because the purpose of it has to do with that family and that soul who have something they need to communicate to one another. And it's very important that that be uh, the primary target, so to speak, uh, which is what the, and one of the things, part of my process, as you asked earlier, was every night as I was getting ready to go to bed and prepare to have out-of-body experiences and stuff, I would ask Megan, I'd say, okay, Megan, what does your mother need to hear from you? What do you need to say to her for her to be okay and for you to be okay? And you need to be real specific with me here so that we can get right to what she needs from you and what you need from her. Uh, And I would try to focus her in also and say, okay, now this is going to be real hard for me to keep track of all these details right before your life because it's very complicated but we need to make sure that we get what she needs to know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like in that one instance, it was simple. It was, it was an accident, not suicide or murder. And uh, in this case, it was a lot, a lot more complicated. It was very complicated. Kind of made it interesting. (laughs) You know, and that's even that is evidential, right? Yeah. Because this is a very, very complicated situation. And I'm just giving yes. you kind of a thumbnail sketch of, you know, of everything that, that went on, but it was, uh, it was very complicated. Well, um, Marilyn, we are going to, I'm going to be in touch with you and I'm hoping we can collaborate and do some other things in, in the future. I, I think your work is wonderful and I encourage everyone to check out, even though you may have those initial 
kind of reservations and doubts whether it's okay to go to something called the Out of Body Travel Foundation dot org, <laughs> please do so and stretch your mind a little bit, and you never know what you might discover. So, well, the web address is actually outofbodytravel dot org, but it's called the Out of Body Travel Foundation. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tell you what, if you you have quite a presence on the web. If someone Google's out of body travel, they're going to find you. I, I have no doubt about that. That's true. The, it's number one on all the search engines, so they should be able to find it. If you just look up out of body travel, you'll find it. It's the out of body travel foundation website. And there's all sorts of resource, resources on it, including uh, some, and there's a special video section called science and research that has a lot of video footage of a lot of the science that's being done around out-of-body travel, near-death experiences, and reincarnation. So there's a lot of resources even for those who want to look into the science of it. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Alex. It's been a great experience. Okay, well, the last interview I wanted to share with you is with Megan's mom, Michelle. Here are some clips from that interview. Another of the the most profound facets of of the information that Marilyn sent is was immediately where she conveyed that Megan had was conveying to her that she had been seeking and searching spiritually before her death, and that she was you know that she had been confused. You know, she had been misled and she had been confused and that then now that she was uh, communicating through Marilyn that she, that she got, she, she's on the right track now. And that was profound to me because that's exact, Megan was, Megan was spiritually uh, seeking and, and she had stumbled onto the, you know, into the wrong some wrong paths and um right before she died and she was reading the bible every day and uh you know um praying and and she just you know she felt like she had she that was that was where she needed to be that's where she was finding her answers and i thought that was so profound that that marilyn was able to um interpret that through Megan and and she knew nothing about that and and I, I don't feel like it was just irony you know I think that that Megan was saying ah oh, this is the real answer mom this is you know this is what um what I was seeking and and this is the truth and um so I, I thought that was really amazing that Megan felt it important to even communicate that part yeah, I thought it was I thought it was pretty remarkable too. It's kind of hard objectively to pick out that kind of information and say that that's some general right. information that someone would would give. And, and again, you know, through the whole process, uh suicide was never mentioned to Marilyn. She never knew until a half an hour ago when I spoke to her on the phone that Really? Uh, yeah, she never knew that and that was never disclosed to her. So Oh, and she never knew that the the exact conflict that was surrounding the issue of Megan's passing until I just told her told it to her, and she was like, "Wow, that really makes a lot of sense in yeah. terms of what she was getting from Megan." So right. it's been a very interesting experience and a great experience and a and an opening experience for me too. You know, I mentioned to Marilyn, this has helped me understand how I need to go forward in doing this work in the future and how we do need to really, really respect, you know, the work that's being done from the other side and the work that's being done with the people who are still here and all that. So I, I really appreciate your your openness, Michelle, and your willingness to to share this story and to participate in this. It, it's been really great. Well, it's, you know, I've been so grateful and I I can tell you, Alex, that there has been a huge healing component in all of this. Um, There really has. And as, you know, as sad and as, um, you know, as traumatic and 
and all of that that it's been if you know if there can be good there ha- there has been there has been good from it you know and this is this has been huge and and it, and it just was uh <clears throat> you know just a reminder and and then um just a reminder that you know we really are just spiritual beings having a human experience and i and i know that she's you know i know i know that she's still here with me and like you did mention that the lights went on and off and yeah that that is a has been a very very real phenomenon ever since she died um and more more so in the beginning and you know in the beginning but it did happen the other day when i was specifically communicating over the phone to my husband i was in tears and i w- i had just received this email this answer that i'd been looking for for all this time and i was very emotional and my husband said you know he he had read the email from Marilyn and he said, um, you know, Megan, Marilyn said that, you know, Megan is said that, you know, she's going through this process of healing and understanding and, you know, where she is, which is different from where you are, but it's still a process and and she's going through it just like you are trying to you know trying to understand and mm-hmm. and she's seeking for answers and and when he said that and I started crying the electricity in the whole entire house went out right, right. and i you know i've lived here 2 years and that has never happened right. um when she died in the apartment that i had you know for the 2 years after she died that happened all the time and just I mean, just amazing, amazing, miraculous ways. Um, but it had not happened here. And uh, for it to happen at that moment was my, that was confirmation that Megan was listening in on that conversation. Megan knew exactly what we were talking about. And that was her way of communicating right on. That's exactly right, you know? So what do you think? Are we to believe everything that Marilyn Hughes has to say about the spiritual realm just because she gave some pretty accurate information on this reading? Well, I don't know, but I can tell you this. You know, a couple months ago, Dr. Julie Beischel from the Winbridge Institute, you know, one of the foremost researchers in this area, well, she was out here in San Diego and gave a very excellent public presentation. And she also, with the help of a very hardworking volunteer named David Jasperson, was able to set up some very interesting meetings with hospice workers on one hand and grief counselors on the other. And as Julie was recounting what had, what had transpired during her trip and what she learned, it became clear to me just how outrageously out of balance our intellectual perspective is on this topic. I mean, consider for a minute whether you believe everything that Marilyn Hughes has to say or not. Just consider for a minute that we're training thousands of grief counselors across the United States, and we're sending them out in the field, and we're not exposing them to any of this information. And the reason we're not is because we don't know if it's real. And the reason we don't know if it's real is because we haven't bothered to look. I mean, if I can sit here and in a couple months put together a demonstration like this, a demonstration that is highly suggestive of some kind of anomalous communication and is at the very least highly suggestive that the process can be very beneficial to the grieving, how can we ignore it? And if you're a skeptic, how can you possibly justify standing in the way of this research going forward? I'm not talking about taking sides. I'm not talking about converting you to the believing. I'm talking about why would you want to be an impediment to finding out whether this works, whether it works in terms of communicating with the dead or whether it works with comforting the grieving. Yet that's the exact situation we're in. We've allowed our quote unquote mainstream scientists and the skeptical community to create a huge barrier, a barrier that's been impossible for most researchers to overcome. And hence, this research just doesn't get done. 
So that was August 2008. As I mentioned, I had just started this research demonstration project with Dr. Stephen Novella and his skeptical buddies. I keep calling it I keep calling it a research demonstration project because as you can appreciate from just listening to Julie, there's quite a difference between doing the kind of demonstration I was just talking about and serious academic quality peer-reviewed research that Julie was doing. At the same time though, it should be obvious that you can get pretty darn close with a well-run demonstration that implements some of the basic controls that Julie was just talking about, right? I mean, let's get real here. Skeptics claim that mediums succeed through cold reading techniques. Like they go fishing for information, say stuff like, hey, I see a name that starts with an M or maybe a W in your past or future. And then they rely on the person jumping in there and blurting out, that's my Uncle Will, you know, and then they go from that. Hey, that's the skeptical claim. That's what cold reading is supposed to be. Well, if you just insert a proxy sitter into the mix, that is, you don't really let the person who wants the reading talk directly with the medium, well, then all that stuff goes away, right? Because you can control as a proxy whether you blurt out anything, whether you say anything at all, which Julie doesn't, right? And the same goes with the claim that mediums read someone's body language or facial expressions or whatever. Again, proxy sitter, just put them in the middle. There's none of that. There's nothing to read. They don't have it, especially if the proxy sitter is blinded from, doesn't know anything about the sitter, the person asking for the reading, well, then they, they can't pass any information because they don't know it. So that's a very simple control that really tackles 99% of all this nonsense about cold reading. So it doesn't, or at least it shouldn't, take much to satisfy the skeptics in this case. A simple, fair-minded demonstration with basic controls really should put the whole matter to rest. It, it, it should, anyway. So that's what I set out to do. I wanted to do a simple demonstration along the lines of Julie's research, informed by Julie's research and some of the control techniques that she had implemented. I wanted to bring those into my research project. So I began recruiting mediums. It's really not that hard to find out who the good mediums are and call them up, ask them if they want to do the project. I began recruiting sitters. Again, it's not hard to find people who want to get a free reading and connect with their dearly departed. I ran ads on Craigslist and people responded. Now, at first, I had in mind this semi-automated questionnaire kind of thing, but I ran into problems with that. And one of the problems I ran into is what Julie mentions there is I wasn't really serving anyone's needs. I wasn't really giving people a reading that they could use. And I ran into other problems as well in terms of this blinding and control, you know, do names matter, all this kind of stuff. Point is, I spent months and a lot of time, a lot of energy and a little bit of money really trying to get this thing right. And all the while, I was trying to get Dr. Stephen Novella and his Skeptic's Guide to the Universe buddies to join in. But it kept getting harder and harder to engage these guys as time went on. They were moving on to other stuff. They never came right out and said they didn't want to do this project anymore. But they stopped responding to email. They made themselves unavailable. And it was clear that that project with them was stalling. But I was still interested in this, and I had evolved into doing readings where I was serving as the proxy. So I would have someone who wanted to connect with someone on the other side, and I would get just basic information from them, name of the person they were trying to connect with, and the date of their passing. I think those are the two pieces of information I took. And then I would then do the reading with the medium and say, I just have this information. Can you tell me anything? It was an interesting experience. I, I did a number of these. And then sharing them with the person who was trying to connect was a fascinating experience. Some of them were incredibly accurate and incredibly meaningful. Others, not so much. But that's kind of the nature of this kind of anomalous communication. But along the way, I was also questioning the purpose of this, what I was really trying to do, who I was really trying to convince of this truth. And in that process, as they say, fate intervened. And it was in June of 2009, after months of working on this project, that I decided to take one more stab at making it public. And I published a rather amazing medium demonstration I did with Marilyn Hughes and a mother 
from Austin, Texas, who had lost her daughter. And as you'll hear in a minute, when I published this, I told everyone a little bit about the journey that I'd been on and how this experience had not only further convinced me of the reality of all this, but had shown me the deeper purpose in this work. I think you'll understand what I mean when you listen to this interview. Okay, now on today's show, we're going to dig into the nuts and bolts of psychic medium research. And we're going to look back on some of what's been done in the past and the criticisms of it. And we're going to look forward to the kind of research we might do in the future in collaboration with open-minded skeptics like Ben Radford from the Skeptical Inquirer and Steve Novella from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And there's no better person to join us and help us in this than Julie Beischel from the Winbridge Institute in Tucson. And Julie, as many of you know from our previous interview with her, is researching medium communication as a way of answering or at least examining the bigger question of whether our consciousness survives death. So Julie, thanks for joining us again on Skeptico. Thanks for having me. As you know, from the email dialogue we've had back and forth, we had Ben Radford on the last episode, and we wound up kind of wading into this whole issue of medium communication, and the work that you did with Gary Schwartz came up. And I, I think what I'd like to do is, is start with a quote from Ben that kind of summarizes his feelings about that research, and then I want you to, to respond in general and I also want you to, and I think this is going to be interesting both to me and to our listeners, I, I want to work with you and go through the real timeline here of what we're talking about in terms of Gary's publication of the Afterlife Experiments books, then the response by Ray Hyman, Gary's response, and then you joining the team at University of Arizona and what you all went through, some of the changes you made and then your latest research. So let's kick that off by going back and listening again to what Ben had to say when he was on our show in the last episode. Let me, let me give you another example. Then, you know, Gary Schwartz's Afterlife Experiments. Um, you know, uh, Gary Schwartz has published a couple books and studies that, that you know, in which he's claiming that, that there's strong evidence for, for uh, communication with the afterlife. And, um, and Ray Hyman, who, who I'm sure you know, uh, was a you know psychologist at the University of Oregon, an incredible uh, statistician, uh, went through and looked at Schwartz's uh, claims, and and he he found serious methodological flaws in in the analyses and the methodologies. Okay, so a general response to that. Well, um, that book was published before I started performing mediumship research at the U of A. In fact, before I even knew what a medium was. So I really can't comment on its content because I wasn't involved at all. Okay. Well, then... And like you said, there are several published critiques and responses if people are interested. Here's what I was trying to get at, Julie. It, it sounds to me like, you know, the chronology that we're laying out here is this book comes out, Gary's getting some criticism, and as you've related to us in the previous interview, your meeting with Gary or the chance meeting that you had was really quite coincidental. And Gary saw in you the ability to maybe tighten up some protocols that he had and, and was developing and maybe was not spending as much time on as he should have. Certainly your background would be someone that uh, someone in Gary's position would immediately see the value of in terms of what he's doing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, well, tell me if that's correct and, and how your background does fit with uh, the, the kind of research that Gary was doing? Well, I can't really speak to you know, what he was thinking when he met me. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, what was conveyed to me was because I had a strong background in methodological design in a quote, hard science. Um, they thought that would be Gary and the donor uh, thought that that would be helpful in um, the continuation of the research into yes, tighter protocols. Because, again, your background is pharmacology, where you're basically being trained to take new drugs and see if they're safe and effective, right? Yeah. In essence, that's what pharmacology is. So you and Gary started working together. When did you actually begin your research with Gary? When did you start developing a new protocol and then looking for participants and actually starting trials? Well, when I first came on board, 
um, I wasn't very familiar with the field at all. And so um, he was sort of already in the process of asking questions like, um, does the sitter need to be there for a reading to be successful? Or can a proxy sitter be serve in place of the sitter? Does that work? Can you ask the medium specific questions about the um, discarnate or can it, does it just need to be free form? So we did some of that, those sorts of studies at the beginning. And then um, once I was learning more and more about the field, it became my goal to statistically establish the existence of the phenomenon of mediumship itself um, in a contemporary laboratory with modern day mental mediums. I felt like maybe we had sort of skipped a couple steps ahead. Like we had, you know, we, so we needed to back up to um, what we call the primary hypothesis, um, which is can mediums do what they claim to be doing? So that's when we performed, designed and um, recruited subjects and performed the study that then went on to be published, um, the triple blind study. And so we, that, we nicknamed that the primary hypothesis study, or we also call it um, the AIR, which stands for anomalous information reception, which is uh, what we call the phenomenon or process of mediumship. Okay, so let's deconstruct that a little bit. Mm -hmm. You felt, and Gary felt, obviously, that that maybe what needs to be done is to back up and look at the underlying hypothesis, which is, how would you state the underlying hypothesis in kind of layman's terms? <laughs> I could probably say this in my sleep. So the primary hypothesis is, skilled mediums can report accurate and specific information about the deceased loved ones termed discarnates, of living people termed sitters without any prior knowledge about the discarnates or the sitters and in the complete absence of any sensory feedback. So how do you think the work been done prior was not directly addressing that kind of underlying hypothesis? Where had we kind of ventured away from that a little bit? Um, again, I wasn't around for that. That book came out in 2002. So the current research is well beyond those methods. In our lab and other work that's being done by, for instance, Archie Roy and Tricia Robertson in Scotland and Emily Kelly and Diane Archangel at the University of Virginia. So, like, it's, I don't think it's useful to sort of nitpick at that because we're so far beyond it that it doesn't, you know, it's like saying, why did we think the earth was flat? Well, it doesn't matter because now we know that it's not. Uh, you know, maybe. But I mean, I think the part that I disagree with that is that uh, the, the history of it, I don't think we have to run from. And and again, I think that the historical context that I would add to it is that so if Gary Schwartz is the first one to not, and he's not the first one because there's a hundred year history of this. Exactly. But if if he stumbles across this himself and is blown away by these readings and he goes in and he does what he does in afterlife experiments. I think it's useful to look back and say, okay, objectively, where was that maybe stretching the boundaries of what we, what we really thought we know, and where did we need to kind of pull in our ranks a little bit and go back to kind of the, the primary hypothesis that we're looking at? So I'm not really asking you to comment on the research per se, but more, why did you feel there was this need to, and, and, you, and we, we can move past this, but why was there a need to more tightly define the research hypothesis. How about we we can look at it, like you said, it's a hundred years of research, so we can look at it sort of in a historical perspective. How did it used to be done and what were the problems and then how is the current research addressing those problems? So do you want to sure. list those fair. issues to me again and I'll address those? F fair enough, fair enough. And, and I, I guess just to, to push that point a little bit further, I, I think that the way that you described it and, and the way that you went through your process there, described your process of going back and saying, okay, what is the primary hypothesis? I think is outstanding. And if you're recalling the interview that I had with uh, ben Radford last week. It's a mistake that skeptics make as well. So you're kind of saying, hey, I felt like maybe the lab was was pushing the boundaries a little bit further than we needed to. We needed to take a step back. Well, the thing, same thing happens when you listen to skeptics. And what they'll do is when they get some data in that's uncomfortable, that pushes their boundaries, that, hey, maybe I'm not in solid ground, then they jump ahead and start asking hypothetical questions. Well, then why isn't the communication this way? Well, then why can't they answer this? Why can't they answer this? So what I want to really make clear is how important it is to be crystal clear and focused 
in the research hypothesis. And I think that's something that, that you and Gary did to your credit on this or second round or whatever round you wanted to call it that you did. So again, the, the, let's get back to the, the primary objections, I think, of that initial research from the University of Arizona was number one, a judging bias. Number two, a control group bias. And number three, the ones that everyone really kind of grabs a hold of right off the bat is sensory leakage. So do you want to go through those? Yeah, let's go from the back end backwards. So sensory leakage, yeah, if the medium and the sitter are in the same room, obviously there's sensory leakage, even if you use a partition, because the medium can, as soon as the sitter says anything, the tone of voice, that even if the sitter just says yes or no, like you can say yes, you can say yes. You know, it's very different, and that gives a lot of information to the medium. So you you can't have the medium and the sitter in the same room. There's always going to be sensory leakage. Even on the telephone, there's sensory leakage for those same um, reasons where a lot of information comes through the sitter's voice. So in the current research, the sitter is not on the phone with the medium. It's just a proxy sitter. So I serve as the proxy sitter. And it's just the medium and I on the phone. And I don't know anything about the sitter or the deceased person. Okay. And then just the medium and I do a reading. Okay, that, that's great. And I want to make that crystal clear. On the readings that you're doing now, the medium never talks to the person they're doing the reading for. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So that part is totally out of the equation. Right. And I want to just backtrack for a minute and, and, and point out that you're talking about it in very, very tight, scientifically controlled terms, which is great. But the counterclaim to that has never been proven either, as far as I know. And that's that sensory leakage, nonverbal cues, uh, tone of voice can explain all the information that's, that we know is passed between a reading. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's not. But sometimes when we hear that skeptical counterclaim, we have to keep in mind that that is an, an equally unproven scientific claim. And in fact cold reading demonstrations using the same kind of even lax controls that were used at the University of Arizona back for 2000 back in 2002 ha- have never been done showing that you can get the names of uh, uh, of deceased uh, relatives and and be able to put all those together in a way that makes a meaningful reading now there's no reason to go back and really try and recreate kind of a flawed protocol and see if it generates a good control to counter the the to counter the work that was done. But I just feel a need to kind of point that out because sometimes when we concede that we need to improve something, it's not conceding that the counterclaim has really been established. And and I think in this case, it hasn't. I would agree with that. Let's move on and talk about control group bias. Let's go to the other one because this same idea controls for rater bias. Doesn't hear the reading as it takes place, then we can give the the sitter two different readings to score without knowing which is which. And so they don't, that, that controls for rate or bias because the sitter doesn't know which reading is theirs and they score one that's theirs and one that isn't with the same, you know, I don't know how you want to say it, amount of bias or level of bias. Um, And it sort of uh, washes it out then. Let's break that down a little bit because I think it, it, it slipped past me the first time I ran across your research. I'm trying to think what's the best way to do this, whether we should, because we're kind of talking about the end, the judging bias. Maybe mm-hmm. at this point, would it would be more useful to go through and very quickly go over your protocol, and then we can, it just becomes crystal clear to anyone who's objective that there cannot be any judging bias and there cannot be any control group bias. So why don't we start with going over how the protocol, how the protocol works? Our current protocol uses a quintuple blind methodology. So there's five levels of blinding. And how we do it is we start with a group of sitters and we screen them and they describe the, the one person they wish to hear from most that's deceased. And then we take those descriptions and we find pairs of deceased people who are the most opposite. And then we that creates a pair of sitters. And then each medium reads a pair of sitters or a pair of discarnates. So for example, okay, now, now hold on before you, before you lose me and lose everybody else. So, so you start with all these potential people that would like to get a reading. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you do that's, that's 
different from the prior research that was done at the University of Arizona. You narrow it down and you say, okay, I want you just to select one person that you specifically want to talk to on the other side, if you will, one deceased person. Mm -hmm. So this prevents the kind of... uh, fishing around that makes everyone uncomfortable, both skeptics and believers, where the medium goes, it's maybe an aunt or it's maybe a grandmother or a friend and all this. Because now the medium is going to be tasked with just targeting in on one specific deceased person. Is that correct? That's correct. And the other thing that you do here that I think is really, really significant, and it's brought up or or kind of Ben Radford last week had a similar kind of thought without realizing that you had already done this in the research that you published more than a year and a half ago. And that's that you actually pre-select pairs of people based on how different the person that they're trying to connect with is. Right. I think I, I wrote down a quote. I think like I, I don't, I think this is close to what he said. He said enough variation between subjects should exist so that meaningful distinctions between subjects can be made. That's exactly what we do. So, so take us through like a, a, an example of how that would work. So we, we pair the people to be most opposite in age, physical description, personality description, hobbies, cause of, and cause of death. Okay, so I say I come along and I'm a potential research participant and I say, gee, Julie, I'd really like to connect with my grandmother who passed away and she passed away when she was 95 and she was a small woman in stature, five foot one, and she had uh, olive skin and her hobbies were going to church and knitting. Okay, we would find another sitter who had a discarnate that was young and, you know, active and blonde and had died um, of a, like a, of an accident rather than, you know, if your grandmother died of old age, it was a slow process. So we, we pair the person to be most different on a variety. It's not just, you know, it's hair color and build and height and cause of death would be part of the body that was affected fast or slow, natural or unnatural. And then hobbies are inside or outside and Okay, so what we're picking up here, we had, to, we had a little technical difficulty. And, and I think what what you were going over was all the different factors that you consider in a reading anyway, and those are the ones that you kind of match for the, the maximum disparity possible. And the reason that you do that is because, tell us. We pair a pair of discarnates to be most opposite, and then they're the same in gender, but most opposite in everything else. And then the same medium reads both people in the pair. And then each person, so if we, like if you said you wanted a reading from your grandmother and I wanted a reading from my sister, then a medium would do a reading for your grandmother and for my sister. And then I would score both readings and you would score both readings, but we wouldn't know which one was which because we weren't there when the readings took place. So that controls for rate or bias. And then we give a score. I give a score to each reading and you give a score to each reading in addition to item by item scoring. There's a, it's a very complicated scoring process, but then, so my score of your reading serves as a control and your score of my reading serves as a control. So then we statistically compare um, the scores given by the intended sitter to the intended reading and to the scores given by the control sitter to the control reading. Awesome. Now, now let's back up because there's actually, and you're trying, I know you're trying to make it as simple as possible, but there's a couple other steps that you go through there that are, that are also interesting and noteworthy. So we'll put you in the place of the person who's talking to the medium. And the first thing you say to the medium is you give the first name of the person you're trying to connect with, right? Sorry. Yeah. So during the reading, all the medium and I have is the first name of the discarnate. So we start the reading and I give the first name. Great. And that's a good point too. That's all you have. Mm -hmm. So you don't have any information because we're, we're, substituting you here as as we said as a pronoun here but it's not really you you wouldn't be the person who decided who the two uh participants were or, or who the two deceased people that we're trying to connect with you would be blind to that right. right a different experimenter does the pairing and screens the sitters and it's my research assistant michael so michael gets on the phone with all the sitters he gathers all the information he does all the pairing and then he i say okay i'm ready to do two readings and he gives me a first name great so you sit down there and you say miss medium i don't know anything else other than i have a person here who wants to connect with someone named sarah 
ready, go. Mm -hmm. And now they, they go. So you're blind to it. They're blind to it. The reading happens. Now tell us a little bit about what happens after the reading has occurred the transcribing and the the reporting on that. So let's back up a little more even. So during the reading, I give the medium the first name and they're allowed to just give some general information for about 10 minutes. And then I ask those same four specific questions. Describe the physical appearance of the discarnate, describe their personalities, what were their hobbies or how did they spend their time and what was their cause of death? Okay, good point. So, so even in that part though, so for 10 minutes you go, okay, medium, go ahead. What are you getting, Sarah? And they can just say anything. Mm -hmm. And then you take them through a very targeted, which is also a, a, a very uh, important difference uh, or with the way that the prior medium research at the University of Arizona was done. So the one, w one big difference that we pointed out at the beginning is now we're targeting one specific deceased person. We're really not interested in information that comes through on other deceased people. And number two, we're targeting in on certain specific bits of information that we want. What did they look like? Build, height, hair. What was their personality? Introverted, extroverted, hobbies, cause of death. Uh, th these are really specific things that, that you are now asking without knowing what the answer should be or could be. You're just asking the medium for responses to those, right? Correct. Now the, the reading ends. What happens next? So then I'm still blinded. I still don't know anything. So I take the train, I take the recording of the reading and I turn it into uh, a list of single, single individual items of the information that the medium provided. And so like if the, so part, and so part of that formatting process is if the medium makes a reference to the name that I gave, then I pull out all of those references and I pull out all the, the maybes and the could be's. And so if the medium says, I think maybe I'm sort of getting that she might've had red hair. My item is she had red hair. Because you can't Great. say whether she maybe had red hair, if that's true or not. And we're asking the sitters, is this true or not? I'm not, you know, I'm not totally versed in every single mediumship study that ever existed on the planet. But I don't think that's a real, I think that's relatively uncommon. I think that's a, new, a newer protocol. Great. So now you're formatting a, a transcript. So first you get it all transcript, and then you're formatting it down to these single declarative kind of statements of facts. Mm -hmm. And and you, you, a couple of things that you mentioned, just to be clear, if I said you're doing a reading for Sarah, you would take out, obviously, any references to the name Sarah, because that would tip off that that's who the exactly. reading was for. Exactly. And then you have these number of other things, like you said, you, you, you kind of take out, you, you make the statements clear, you take out uh, any kind of medium speak of, uh, you know, uh, the, give me an example of some of the medium speak. Um, I think in the, in my, uh, I wrote a, a paper that I wrote about all this methodology just came out in the journal of um, parapsychology. And I think the example I use in that paper is um, like a medium might say, I'm getting that Sarah is below you, below the sitter, pardon me, um, then that means that they're younger, they're in a younger generation. And if they say, you know, they're to the side of, that means they're in the same generation or above is a generation older. Um, so I, I, in, I put brackets and I sort of define what the medium speak means to the sitter. Okay. And this isn't something you came up with. This is just something, a, a shorthand way of talking that the medium has yeah. that you're translating for the benefit right. of the sitter. It's language that mediums use naturally, and then I define it for the sitter. Okay, great. So now let's get to, let's get down to the, the payoff here. Now you've done a couple of, of readings with you being the intermediary. You've transcribed them, broken them down into these single uh, or a list of kind of declarative statements. Her hair is red. She passed away this way. She was introverted. She liked this, blah, blah, blah. Now what happens? So now I send those two readings and they're just numbered reading one and two. I send those to a third experimenter, Mark, and then Mark and I say, these two readings are for these two discarnates of, we, we lay, we'll name them in group. So Michael says, here are two names in group A. So then I, we do the readings and then I send the two readings, the two blinded readings to Mark. And I say, these are the two readings from group A, but he doesn't know which one is for which name. And he sends them to the sitters for scoring. So now none of us can accidentally convey anything to anybody because we don't know anything to convey. So now the, the, the next person in this chain who you said is Mark, Mark gets the two readings and he sits down with me and says, okay, 
Alex, you want to connect with your grandmother, Sarah. Here are two readings. I don't know which one is for your grandmother, Sarah, but one of them is, and one is for another person. And then I'm asked to do what? So he doesn't sit down with you. He emails the readings to you. And you okay. and Michael has previously trained you on how to do the scoring. So Mark sends you two readings. You already know how to do the scoring. And by yourself, you you score the each of the readings and you email back your scores. Okay, and basically how am I scoring these? So you we have you have the list of items, so you score each item um, for how we say, you know, think to yourself, how well does this piece of information fit? So we have um, we ha- you can it's a numerical you can give it a numerical score and they're not five isn't one better than four they're just named zero through five so five is obvious fit it's it's a concrete hit four is fit requiring minimal interpretation to fit like they almost got it's you know that's pretty close um three is a fit requiring maximum interpretation like "Eh, i guess if you really squinted your eyes that might be right and then two is it doesn't fit the person whose name the reading was for, but it do, it fits somebody else. Um, and one is no fit. That's totally wrong. And zero is I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the information to know whether that's right or wrong. And then when we do the analysis, we use um, scores as four or five as hits and all the rest of them we consider misses. And then... Um, You also give the whole reading a score from zero to six, which is a different scale. Um, And that scale is based on the work of Russell Targ um, and Jane Catra. That's a scoring that they developed for remote viewing, like how you would score a remote viewer's picture or response. And then as a third way of quote scoring, we say pick which reading you think is yours. So you have this item by item, you know, percent of accurate items data and then you have a whole reading zero to six score of the reading and then you have a binary is it or is you know yes or no is this your reading and so you can do statistics on each one of those pieces of data right the reason you can again is because the whole process we went through it's just like me sitting down with these random facts that i have i have no idea where they came from and i have to pick whether they fit, whether they match, rate them on a scale of how well they fit, and then come up with an overall evaluation. So at this point, we've kind of addressed, I think, n- n- let's go back to the points we were, we were talking about mm-hmm. a few minutes ago. The judging bias now and the control group bias are both addressed. What was the complaint or the criticism, and there was some validity to it, of the previous Uh, objection to the judging bias? Well, if you know the reading is yours, rater biases, if you know the reading is yours, you may have a tendency to score it as either more or less accurate than it is in reality. But if you don't know which one is yours, you'll score them with the same, quote, amount of bias. Right. So if this is the reading that I got back, I might want to please either the medium or the experimenter, or I might want to displease either the medium or the experimenter, or it might just be human nature that I want to cooperate and want to get along. So I start seeing things in a certain way. And that's kind of out of the equation now because I now have no knowledge of which one of these readings pertain to me. And there's no way I could have any knowledge. Right. So if you score a bunch of things as right, you'll score a bunch of things as right in both of the readings. And so statistically that will cancel out. And if you score both things low, statistically that will cancel out. What the statistic looks for is the difference between the two. Um, Not she got 77% right. That doesn't matter. It's what the difference is between the scores given by the sitters to their own readings and the scores that they gave to someone else's readings without knowing which was which. Great. And what about the medium who is giving a lot of generalities to their answers and are, are just kind of fishing around? How does that not affect this process? Well, we're asking for specific information. So they can't just give general because we're asking for specific pieces of information. And if they just give general, you know, he's kind of short, but kind of tall. That's two items now. He's kind of short and he's kind of tall. And so a medium that just provided general information, one would have a low accuracy percentage and the sitter would have a lot of trouble discerning between the two readings. So they probably would have a low record of the sitter's choice 
and what you'd wind up with at the end of the day is is chance is is sitters picking readings and basically picking them at chance levels 50 50 kind of scores or if you're saying how what score would you give it a one through a six everyone's going to be at the three kind of middle ground and and that's not in the published research that you've done published back in 2006 2007 2007 i'm sorry but you you did it in 2006 published it in in january of 2007 correct i think we probably did it in 2005 but yeah go ahead okay because uh, I think the chronology is really important. I want to get back to this later, but this is work that has been out there for a while. So you published it in January of 2006. It's not like we're springing something on people here that... January 2007. I'm sorry, January 2007. Right. So it's, it's almost two years old now. Almost two years old. So in that published study, I think you had 16 mm-hmm. times mm-hmm. where people had to choose right. which reading is mine. Right. And what percentage of time did they choose the correct reading? 81%. So 13 of those 16 people. And that's a pretty impressive, I assume that was statistically significant, if I remember correctly from the paper. Yes, it's, it's, it's quite significant. Like you're looking for a p-value of less than 0.05, and I think that p was 0.001. Okay, well, well, with that in mind, and now we've, we've, done, we've gone back, and I, I hope that isn't too detailed and exhaustive for people, but... I just think that's fascinating. I think the whole process is is extremely uh, tight, in my opinion, and I'm certainly open to I'm not a scientist, and I'm open to other people and people who are critical of your work to come forward and say where the gaping flaws and holes are. But it, it sure seems to me like it's addressed the main issues. With that in mind, l- let me go back and play a couple more clips from uh, Ben's interview last episode. And then in light of what we now know and have talked about, Let's hear what you might have to say about a couple of these, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I do know about the research. One of the problems, one of the issues it doesn't address is that in many of these cases, the verification of the information is provided by the sitter. That is, this is not information that's supposedly coming from the great beyond that is, it, that is verified by a third-party person. Much of this is information where the, uh, the medium will say, I'm getting information uh, from, you know, your your husband or your grandfather or whatever else, and the, the, the information is judged either accurate or, or inaccurate by the sitter, and, and there's, there's an inherent problem right there that has not been addressed. And I just want to remind people that I specifically said, you know, Julie Beichel is on the show, and she's done this new research, and he responded, yeah, I'm familiar with that research. So just as a grounding, that's where we're all coming from on that. So what are your thoughts on that? So I'm going to use that our current peer-reviewed methods to address that. So, you know, he's saying he's listing as a criticism the fact that the sitter is the person that judges the information as accurate or inaccurate. So it's important to keep in mind the scope and the goal of the research. So the goal isn't to, to prove the existence of an afterlife. Anyone on my team would say we're not trying to prove an afterlife. That is not the goal. We What we're doing is examining the process of mediumship in its natural environment with the proper controls. Um, So normal readings between a medium and a sitter. And again, the general hypothesis we're testing is can mediums report accurate and specific information without any prior knowledge and in the absence of any sensory feedback? So with that being the goal, the sitter has to be the person that is the judge because the information was intended for the sitter. And we don't ask the hypothesized discarnate. I'm just going to put an asterisk. Every time I say discarnate, I mean hypothesized discarnate. I'm not implying we have established that the medium is talking to a dead person because we haven't. So the hypothesized discarnate. We don't ask the hypothesized discarnate to, you know, take an algebra exam and provide information a third party could determine is accurate. That's not what a mediumship reading is. We're asking them to communicate with their friends and family, the only people who can determine if the information is correct and applicable. Okay, now just to clear, that's that's a good, very, very good point. And just to clarify where I think Ben was coming from, one of the criticisms of the prior research done at the University of Arizona is that if a person comes through and says, Oh, I think you're I connecting with an ant figure and her name is Dolly. Then the person who is accepting the reading can say, yeah, yeah, that's right. And then there isn't the independent verification of whether that's right or wrong that was troubling to some skeptics. 
Right. Because how could you verify whether or not something was wrong about my entire life? I couldn't, you know, I couldn't tell you everything you need to know to do that. I don't know how that's even possible. You've gotten around that whole issue, but by how? how? How have you specifically kind of addressed this issue of that there is someone there who's making these subjective judgments about the accuracy of the data? Well, we're we're controlling for rater bias by having the person b- score two blinded readings, and we're comparing their score of a reading intended for them to a, their score of a reading not intended for them. Right. So the big problem before is as the skeptics will will point out in in some cases very correctly, is that the reading could pile up like positive points, like that's a hit, that's another hit, that's another hit. Oh, your percent is going up and up and up. And now what you've done is kind of taken that out of the equation because it really doesn't matter how high or how accurate any particular reading is. It's more of a comparison. How does this reading compare with the other reading? And And that's how you've really... I think, in a very novel way, controlled for this whole idea of, of Raider bias. Their, their bias, they can be biased one way or another way, but it's going to wash out with the control reading that they have. Right, because they'll be the same bias for each reading, because they won't know which is theirs. Here's, here's the next quote from Ben. Part of the problem here is that, is that those descriptions that you just gave, those can still be vague. Someone says, you know, the person that's coming through is a tall man with, with, um, with you know, uh, with gray hair. Well, it turns out that when the person died, he was bald. Again, this gets back to the problem of, of having the sitter verify the information because if the sitter says, yes, he had gray hair, then that's a hit. That, that's good information. But the, the medium could also say he was bald, in which case the, the sitter would say, well, you know, he had gray hair, but then in his last years, you know, he was bald. So, you know, you, so you can have a medium giving two contradictory pieces of information, both of which would be considered a hit by the sitter. Okay, and I think we've probably covered that, but go ahead. So I think this is important just to address, and and then I'll get to that specifically. So ideally, laboratory-based mediumship research has to include two things. One, an environment that optimizes the process for everyone involved, the medium, the hypothesized discarnate, the sitter, in order to increase the probability of capturing the phenomenon if it exists. And two, methods that maximize the blinding to control for any conventional explanations for the information. So together, those two factors optimize the possibility of achieving positive results while also controlling for experimental artifacts. So we, hold on, hold on, wait. <laughs> I have a, I have a, I have a real world example that will make that much more understandable. Okay. Good. So we use um, this metaphor: you can't study football on a basketball court using baseball players and the rules for hockey. Because if you get negative results, you can't say, I've disproven the phenomenon of football in that case, because you were on a basketball court using baseball players and the rules for hockey. So you can't, that's not a proper experiment. Similarly, it's not appropriate to claim that, you know, Jason Elam can kick a 95 yard field goal if you give him a Nerf football, an empty stadium, and no defensive line. That's not real football either. To in, in order to study football appropriately, only train skilled participants and the regulation equipment environment and regulations can be used. The same thing is true for mediumship. So negative results from a study using methods that didn't optimize the environment and positive maximize blinding are equally ineffective as establishing new knowledge. And this goes back to what you've been calling a, a naturalistic or a natural setting It tries to put everyone in the position that they are when people report these fantastic readings. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's uh, that's so common sense. And yet it it gets so mixed up in the mind of skeptics so many times when I hear it. It's that it goes back to your initial research hypothesis or proposition. If we're going to study, is medium communication real? Shouldn't we do everything possible to let the medium and the sitter have at it in the way that they feel most comfortable with the only caveat being that we want to put the proper experimental controls on it. I mean, that just seems like common sense to me. Yeah. And some people call that, oh, well, you're cheating then because you're optimizing. But it's the same thing as saying if you give the football player a football instead of a watermelon or, you know, it's not cheating. It's optimizing so you can watch the process as it takes place, take place. And I think people fail to understand that proper research design includes optimizing the possibility of achieving achieving positive results. If you wanted to study 
plant growth. You don't put a dry seed on the bench top in the lab and then say, plants can't grow. And, you know, you use soil and water and sunlight, and then you study the growth of the seed. Right. Do everything possible. to Once you've put the proper controls in place, why not do everything possible to recreate the phenomena? I I completely agree. Now, what about Ben's point about the information being vague? Maybe I say the hair was black, but I was bald older. I mean, you know, that thing. Okay. So I think his main point was that two pieces of contradictory information can be judged as hits by the student. And so, again, we have to keep in mind the process of mediumship. So first, the medium is interpreting images, symbols, sounds, you know, whatever. So she actually may receive two items that appear contradictory, but we instruct them to say what you see. That's the process. And we're studying the process. So we have to, you know, we can't mess with the process. Um, Second, as is often the case, as anyone who has ever been in a relationship can attest, communication between people is not black and white. Uh-huh. And things can be contradictory and accurate at the same time. So then let's follow that piece of information or those seemingly contradictory pieces of information through your protocol and see what happens at the end and see if they do create this mix up in the final judging of the data. So the person says, uh, black hair, bald, two things that are contradictory. Mm-hmm. Older in life, they were bald. Earlier in life, they had black hair. How do you score it? How do you report it? And then how does the sitter score it? So we're not asking the medium to describe a photo of the discarnate. We're asking them to describe aspects of the whole entire dynamic lifespan of the person. So just like that's entirely accurate for the person to be bald at some points in their life and dark hair in some points of their life, and they may, discarnate may present themselves to the medium in each of those ways. And it's accurate for the sitter to score each of those items as accurate because they are both accurate. And during scoring, again, we're not ranking up the number of hits. We're comparing the number of hits to the number of hits in a control reading. So if the medium always, you know, if in one reading she says, well, he was bald at some point and he had dark hair at some point, um, and then the other ring says, well, he's bald at some point, but he was blonde at some point. Then those two those two times that she said bald cancel each other out because they're counted as hits in the control group and in the intended group. Great, which is really the, the important distinction that we want to make. Okay, next clip from Ben Radford's critique of your work. Okay, tell you what, use subjects uh, who are who who do not fit what most people would consider to be a normal profile. So you know, so have a subject who maybe lost his legs uh, in an accident during the war. Well, I, I think we've hit this. Well, I did want to I actually did want to address that specifically. Again, we have to keep in mind the scope of the research. We're not setting up a condition where the discarnate has to prove something. We're interested in studying mediumship under conditions that exist normally. So that is where the medium provides information, allowing the sitter to identify the discarnate. I think where he was going was just to say, let's get people that are different so that those differences are highlighted in the reading. And that's the first thing that you do. And I just want to bring us back to that and make it clear. that Yeah. And then another issue with that is that even if we did that, it would be um, very difficult, right? Because you're there aren't a whole lot of people in the world who have lost their legs or have a birth defect or whatever. And I don't even so think. It's a, very small, yeah, and- it's a very small percentage of people. And even if you did that experiment where all the people had something special about them, then all you could conclude at the end of the day was mediums can report specific and accurate information about special deceased uh-huh, people. Uh-huh. Well, we're not interested in right. that study. We're interested in where, how does mediumship work in its natural environment? And, uh, let me go ahead and really go out of limb here and speak for Ben Radford. <laughs> which is, uh, <laughs> but I think where he was going was just taking the, the mundane out of it, which is kind of the next quote that I wanted to play for you. And I think they're related. I think he's saying, you know, let's look at people who are different and not because I think incorrectly on his part, he had this vision that all these readings are being done for 80 year old grandmothers who passed away, you know, and, and you're doing just the opposite of that. So let me play this, this next quote, because I think it relates back to exactly what we're talking about here. Okay. Well, I mean, part of the, part of my problem with, with the the whole notion of, of mediumistic communication is that uh, is that a lot of the stuff is so mundane? Okay, I just, I have one word: football. Like that's like saying, "Oh, I don't like watching football because the players don't fly." Well, that's not how football works. 
So we have to keep in mind how the process works. And we've actually found mediums most often report three kinds of information. Information that allows the sitter to identify the discarnate. So I call that, it's me, it's me. And um, events that have occurred since the discarnate's passing uh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm still here. I saw you at that birthday party or I saw that you got married or whatever. Like I'm still in your life even though I've died. And then three, messages of an emotional nature. I love you. So we need to keep, we also have to keep in mind the scope of the research. We're not looking to prove the existence of an afterlife. We're interested in the phenomenon of mediumship. Mundane or not, the information is meaningful to the sitter. And that's what we're studying. I think it's also important to recognize that the majority of all human communication is uh-huh. mundane. Um, I like to say we study human communication. One of the people just happens to be uh-huh. dead. And you don't study normal human communication by asking people to, you know, talk about quantum physics. You just ask them to talk to each other. And that's what we're doing. And of course, what's mundane for one person or another or a third observer is incredibly relevant to uh, an individual. I, I can say from my personal experience, with a reading using just kind of the very basic of control, so it's not like a scientific reading. Some information that I would tell that I could report to you about that reading would seem incredibly mundane and to me was was mm-hmm. deeply, deeply meaningful, almost to the point of bringing me to tears in terms of how how relevant that was to me on an emotional level. So, And I think that brings up another point. Like I think Mr. Radford said something about Like he was saying, oh, well, if the medium just says the discarnate says he loves you and he literally said, what value is that? Again, let's remember what we're what we're studying. It's a deceased person communicating with the people that they loved who are grieving and suffering and missing him, not, you know, a graduate student defending their dissertation. So what would you say to your family if you had died and you could witness their mourning? I would say I love you. I think the mistake here, again, is that we're trying to prove an afterlife and we're not. We want to look at a mediumship reading with normal people receiving normal messages from their normal deceased relatives. That's what we study. And I think critics think mediumship readings contain life altering or extraordinary pieces of information, but that's like expecting those types of information to show up in phone calls or letters or emails from someone that you haven't been able to talk to for a while. To an outsider, like you said, the information may seem mundane, but it's really meaningful to the person receiving it. And I actually want to correct something you said in the in that interview alex you said we don't score i love you as accurate but after we have the medium answer those four specific questions about the discarnate's physical life we honor the sitter and the discarnate by asking the medium does the discarnate have any messages for the sitter this provides motivation for the sitter um, to participate and the discarnate to participate and not just to have to jump through our hoops you know hey dead person show up for our study and answer these questions and then go away like they, this may be the only opportunity they have to convey important messages to their deceased or to their living um, relatives. So those messages items are scored in the same way that the other items are. But again, you, we compare the control. So if they always said, I love you, it'd be right in the control reading and in the intended reading and it would wash out. But I also want to make the point that I love you is not an automatic hit. Right. If the medium said, I love you, that my mom was saying, I love you, I would score it as wrong because we never (laughs) said that in my family. Uh And I would say, you must be talking to the wrong person because my mom would never say that. So it's not like when someone says, I love you, that's an automatic hit because not everybody would say that. Great point. And thanks for that clarification. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in wrapping up all of the the comments that that Ben had about your research, we have one more that we've touched on, but let me play it one more time and, and have you address it directly. I mean, I have yet, and if you can if you can point me to to an example of this, I'd be happy to follow it up and write it down and and say that I was wrong. But I have yet to find a case either in 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 sci research generally or in Gary Schwartz's experiments specifically that have information that neither the medium nor the sitter knew. Okay, so the final yeah. clip thoughts on that. So I think I did address that. Um, again, we're not. Um, trying to prove an afterlife. We want to study mediumship under its normal condition. And there have been cases where the medium often, I've heard mediums say a reading doesn't happen without the discarnate providing information that the sitter didn't know because it's the most evidential for the sitter. But it's not evidential in the lab because it doesn't separate telepathy from survival as explanations. So it's not ideal. It's not something we would look to collect 
because it doesn't answer any question. Okay, what would be the best way for Skeptico to put together some examples for Ben to see where uh, where this has occurred? Taking out the survival issue and just saying, is another person able to connect with information that the receiving person didn't know about? I think in your when you do your demonstration, you can specifically we we did a small pilot study where we specifically used the question, please provide information that is unknown to the sitter medium or experimenter and can be verified later. Okay. And so you can, and a lot of the medium said they they do that every time anyway. So you can specifically ask for that type of information and then specifically follow up with the sitter. I, I would suggest that because again, we haven't done it officially in a controlled way. So I don't have, I don't have data on that. Great. Well, we'll do that. I just can, I just can tell you it happened. I've seen it. I, I'm not, I don't have any specific examples because we haven't looked at it specifically. So I started this episode slash chapter by stating that there were three reasons why skeptics believe that no one in recorded history has ever had some form of strange, unexplainable, anomalous communication with a deceased loved one. And those three reasons, again, are number one, they're willfully ignorant of the research. And I think when you listen to Julie Beischel, you can get a pretty good sense of just the kind of solid scientific research that they continue to be willfully ignorant of, continue to intentionally ignore, and continue to distort and misrepresent. The second reason I mentioned was that they've never properly investigated the subject for themselves. Hey, so many times on this show, I've implored people to just get a reading. Be your own proxy sitter. Find a medium and tell them, look, what would be most useful for me is confirmation of the reality of this phenomena. And I am therefore not going to say anything during this reading. I'm only going to give you the name and the date of the deceased, and I'm not going to say anything else. Mediums will agree to this. I know they will because I've done it over and over myself. You might not have a successful reading the first time out. I had to go through, the first time I did this for myself, I had to go through three mediums. Interestingly enough, the first two refunded my money, something you would never expect a medium to do. But they said, hey, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to be effective for you. I wasn't able to give you what you need, so I'm going to give your money back. I can't guarantee that every medium will do that, but that was my experience. But the third reading I had was incredibly evidential. And I think anyone who tries themselves to confirm this and just uses some basic blinding controls like I just talked about can prove this for themselves. But skeptics never do. They never try. So that leaves us with only one reason, reason number three, the big reason, skeptics, including anyone who doesn't call themselves a skeptic, but is really a skeptic. The only reason they believe what they do about psychics and mediums is that they live in a constructed worldview that doesn't allow it. It's not true because it can't be true, because it would challenge some of their fundamental beliefs and cause them to rethink who they are. It's not about science after all in all these questions. It's about who am I? What is my relationship to the world? And changing that understanding of who I am is really, really scary. Okay, y'all. So that's the first chapter of my upcoming book, Why Skeptics Are Wrong About Almost Everything. What do you think? What did I miss? What did I get wrong? How can I do it better? Really? How can I do this better? Please pop over to the Skeptico Forum, which you'll find through the Skeptico website at skeptiko.com if you don't know so already. So go over there. Tell me what you think. Better yet, help me edit this. Don't forget, if you're a writer out there and you want the fame and prestige of co-authoring this book, not to mention the meager advance I'm offering, then let me know about that as well. So that's about it. I'm going to do more shows, chapters like this, but I'm going to intersperse them with some new interesting interviews I have coming up. All that's down the road. So until next time, do take care and bye for now. 